The little CFAR summer schools that, that we attended with uh, Frank and uh, so on. Uh, David joined later, I think. Um, okay, so, so Graham did PhD in Toronto with uh, Jeff and Jeff Hinton and Sam Rowais. Right. And then you went off to NYU and worked with Jan LeCun and people there. Yep. Uh, now you're like director or scientific head of Next AI or something. Academic like director, yeah, that's right. Academic <laughs> director, uh, tenure, yep. CRC, CFAR AI chair, many influential papers, a lot in computer vision in particular, conditional restricted volts and machines, <laughs> if you know what that is. Well, I was thinking about this talk on conditional GANs, and I was almost going to call it like a decade of conditioning generative models, because uh, I really, I'm doing this in my PhD, is conditioning generative models. Conditioning is powerful. Changed. Okay, let's welcome Graham. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm Graham. I'm the director of the Center for Machine Learning at Stanford. Uh, I'm going to talk about how you can generate machine learning models with a lot of data and some of the things that you can do with it. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you all for coming at 5 o'clock on a Friday evening. So uh, I know it's not the, not the best time for a talk, but I appreciate you all coming to uh, hear what I have to say. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about conditioning generative adversarial networks. And first, I'll give a review of what conditional GANs are. I'm going to talk about a particular type of conditioning, um, namely text to image synthesis. And then uh, talk to you about conditioning on captions, and then conditioning on visual dialogue. So, then I'm going to get sort of into the meat of the talk, which is looking at two limitations with current uh, conditional GANs. We normally see them generate in a single shot. So you take some noise and the conditioning, and boom, you've got an image. But we've actually set up a paradigm where we can generate it iteratively. So we have a series of instructions that we gradually give to the model, and it will generate kind of like an artist that's uh, painting a scene. And then I'll also talk about uh, how to evaluate conditional GANs. Uh, you uh, probably have heard of things like inception score and, and Frische inception distance. And these things were developed in the context of unconditional GANs. So I'm going to tell you about some of the issues that we run into when uh, we condition and uh, propose a solution for uh, capturing all the, the properties that we want to capture with conditional GANs. So, Here's the intro uh, of conditional or generative adversarial networks. These are not the conditional ones. Uh, I imagine most of the people in the room have seen this before, but it's a very, very popular framework uh, for generating uh, synthetic samples that look like real samples. And the idea is that you're going to push some random noise through uh, um, a, a deep neural net. And this is called the generator. Uh, this is going to transform the noise through a number of layers into uh, for example, an image. You also have access to a, a data set of real images. And then you're going to have this other part of the network which is called a discriminator. And the discriminator is going to take inputs from the real data set and also images that are being generated by your generator. And it's going to try to decide whether they're real or fake. And uh, from the point of view of the discriminator, it wants to call the real data real. It wants to call the images coming from the generator fake. But from the point of view of the generator, it wants it to trick the discriminator. So it wants the discriminator to call its images uh, real. So uh, we get this signal from uh, the discriminator, and that gets fed back to the generator. Effectively, uh, the generator learns how to sort of pull calls in the discriminator and find ways to make the uh, images more and more realistic. So that's uh, what we call an unconditional GAN, where basically feeding in noise and getting out uh, images. We also have conditional GANs. So for example, we can condition on a class label and then tell the model that we want to generate a particular class. We're effectively giving the model some additional structure uh, to guide its generation. We can also uh, typically would, uh, give this conditioning information to the discriminator as well. And we don't necessarily have to condition on a label. We can condition on, say, a bounding box and say, well, I want you to place uh, the uh, synthesized digit in this location and then we'll generate there. Uh, but we could uh, condition on many other things. So we could have segmentation masks. Uh, we could have uh, uh, the bounding box, as we saw here, class labels, uh, image coordinates. People have generated um, images of people in various poses and then condition on the, the desired poses. And of course, we can also condition on text. So um, 
going back a number of years, people have, uh, but starting with the release of the MS Coco data set, people got very interested in conditioning these GANs on uh, image captions. So, I, sorry, I wasn't expecting to, to have four small screens. I was hoping to have one bigger screen, uh, but I'll do my best here. So, there is some uh, text that we're conditioning on. The flower has small, round violet petals with a dark purple center, and we also have noise. And then the network basically learns to synthesize uh, images to match those captions. So um, there's a large body of work that does this, but typically these works, as I mentioned before, they're one set generators. They take a caption, and boom, they create an uh, image. Uh, it's not really an iterative or interactive setup. There are multi-stage approaches. So something that is a little bit closer to our approach is uh, called the stack GAN. And it first generates uh, low resolution images conditioned on the caption. And then it takes those low resolution images uh, and the caption and generates a high resolution image. So this is kind of a two stage setup. Um, but again, the, the caption is still really received in a single shot. We get basically a description of the entire image. Uh, and then it gets generated in multiple stages. And what we're trying to work towards is a series of instructions where we're uh, gradually uh, building up the canvas. Uh, there's a, a model called Attention GAN. Uh, it builds upon Stack GAN, and uh, it actually has an attention module that the generator leverages to focus on particular parts of the image that get uh, generated. Uh, it also introduced this uh, image text similarity module, and uh, that encourages you to generate uh, images that are uh, more aligned with the caption. Uh, still, the, the caption type data here is very static. It's not coming in a series of instructions. And again, it's just basically a one-shot uh, generation of the image. So moving away from captions, uh, this work that I'm going to present today was done in collaboration with Microsoft Research. And our collaborators there had proposed this non-iterative model called Chat Painter, which conditioned not just on an image caption, but on uh, a visual dialogue. So there's a series of questions and answers about a particular image. There's also a caption for this uh, image as well. So the caption is adult woman with yellow surfboard standing in water, uh, and then uh, a series of questions and answers about uh, the image. And uh, the, uh, the chat filter model basically showed that if you were conditioning on both the captions and the dialogue, the dialogue provided a richer set of information uh, and the, the, the resulting images that came generated from this model were superior to just uh, conditioning on the caption alone. So this is a move in the direction of something a little bit more interactive because there's a question and answer series of uh, questions and answers about the images. Uh, but again, um, it's not. It's still a little further away from the, the sketch artist scenario where we're building up the image uh, gradually. So this builds. This brings us. Uh, towards the tasks that we're proposing in this work, which we call the Generative Neural Visual Artist, or Geneva. And uh, we model this interaction uh, between a teller and a drawer. So the idea is that the teller is giving a series of instructions to the drawer. So for example, uh, we start with an empty canvas, and the teller says, at turn one, add a yellow sphere at the center, and the drawer creates a yellow sphere on the canvas, and then the teller says add a purple cube behind it on the right, and then the drawer adds the purple cube on the right, and then the teller says add a blue sphere in front of it, it referring to the last uh, added object, uh, on the left and in front of the yellow sphere on the left. So it's a complex series of instructions, uh, and we're hoping that the images uh, correspond to the series of instructions that's been uh, given. So it's an iterative type of uh, generation, um, and the teller is basically able to gauge the, the progress by observing the images that are generated along the way. So there's a number of challenges with this setup. Uh, first, the drawer needs to learn how to map these complex series of uh, linguistic instructions to realistic objects on a canvas. And it has to maintain not only the object properties themselves, so the, the, the how to draw a blue sphere and a green cube and so forth, uh, but it also needs to understand and maintain relationships between the different objects. And the drawer has to modify the existing drawing uh, in a manner that's consistent with the previous series of instructions. 
uh, and the images that have been generated. So it really needs to be able to remember uh, the instructions that were previously given to it. Yes? How do you handle the size of these uh, objects when you put it like, in the canvas? So like, it can draw like a big yellow. <coughs> you cannot notice this uh, like if we add Right, so you're asking about the size of the object. So in some of our experiments, we uh, control for the size, so that the size is a, a, a parameter um, in what we can say condition on. Uh, in this case, in this particular data set that I'm showing here, um, the objects roughly come in the same size, and the, the model would learn about the size of the objects from the data. So it actually is it, 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 a supervised process. It's getting instructions. It's showing some ground truth images. So it would learn that directly from the data. Uh, you could also imagine a situation where we were talking about size um, of things in the instruction itself, right? where we were observing uh, objects of different sizes, and the, they were actually specifying, specifying sizes in the instruction. And that would be permitted in this model. Yep. So is the text generated using a grammar? Uh, it is in, in this particular data set, and I'll show you that grammar shortly mm -hmm. when I describe the data sets. And it, does it extrapolate beyond the training? Uh, I will show you how it does extrapolate, uh, not in, sort of the, in, in the sense of the, the grammar, but there's, there, there is some surprising generalization that we see. But I'll, I'll get there when I, when I do the experiments. Okay, so um, next I'm going to show you a particular uh, model architecture that we designed for this Geneva process. So this uh, particular type of conditional GAN has been designed for the Geneva test. And it looks relatively complicated, so I'm going to step you through it. Uh, so first what we're given is uh, an empty drawing canvas. So it might look like this up here. Uh, so you have like a scene with a... Uh, sky and some grass, and a list of instructions. So these are similar to what we saw before, a series of instructions telling us what we want to put in the image. Um, and so at every step, we're going to uh, try to synthesize a new image, so we'll call this X tilde. X without the tilde would actually be the ground truth that we have in the training data set. And uh, this is the result of our generator G. Uh, which conditions on noise, uh, and what we have what we call the context-aware and the context-free uh, conditions. So the context-aware uh, conditioning, uh, H, that's actually coming from the instructions, and the context-free uh, uh, conditioning is coming from uh, the previously generated images. So I'll give expressions for those shortly. So this context-aware condition, uh, it's actually the output of uh, a recurrent net, so you can see that happening at uh, the bottom. So we actually link the series of instructions through, through time and build up a representation of uh, past and current instructions. And uh, D right here is actually uh, an embedding of the instruction that comes from another recurrent net. So there's actually, I want to point out to you, there's actually two time scales. There is time scale at the level of the words in a particular sentence, and so that gets embedded through a, what's called a gated recurrent unit into uh, an instruction embedding. And then there's another uh, gated recurrent uh, unit, RNN, working at the level of the terms, instruction by instruction. And so that's building up these representations H. So that gives you the context uh, conditioning. And then what I said, I also said there's this context-free condition, that's actually an embedding of the previously synthesized image. So we have the previously synthesized image going into some encoder and producing some uh, embedding of what was generated before, and that basically allows the generator to see what's already on the canvas before it you know, uses the instructions to put new uh, stuff down on the, on the canvas. Okay, and that's just pointing out what I said before, two different time scales at the level of words and also at the level of instructions. Okay, so that's the generator. Uh, there's also, of course, in the GAN discriminator. And so the, we take a typical GAN discriminator and we modify it in three different ways. So first of all, um, we take the uh, previous image, x uh, till t minus one, and also, uh, 
x till t, either the real or the fake image, depending on whether we're showing it real or fake, uh, encoded into these low-res feature maps uh, using this encoder here, this, this discriminator encoder, and then we fuse them together. And I'll talk a little bit uh, later about how we actually do the fusion. Uh, but basically the idea is that the discriminator is seeing what was there previously and what has been added to the scene by the generator and trying to dis discriminate whether that's real or fake. Um, we also uh, want the model to not just generate realistic looking scenes, but generate scenes that are consistent with the instructions. So we actually have uh, pairs of images and instructions that are both correct and images and instructions that are mismatched. And we also get the discriminator to call those, try to call those fake as well. Did you have a question, Frank? Yeah, just, just keep it a lot of stuff going on. So just, keep, yeah, I do. Just, 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 just keep my head straight. Uh, yes. Are you eventually going to have to have some sort of label sequences of, of images that some artist has put together for you? Yes, exactly. And I will show you some pictures of those very, very shortly. Yes, I'll get, I did a big, pretty big architecture, so bear with me. No, no, I, uh, I, I I'll be, I'm, I'm envisioning that you need to have like a, a sequence of partially correct, or at least time steps between one and two of like put the sun here. Absolutely. So, and, and where you're seeing that, so um, we've got the, this is kind of what you're seeing here, right? Instructions match with image, or next instruction, image, next instruction, Im image. And so where the instructions are coming in, these are the cues, okay? Those are getting uh, embedded into sort of instruction encoding. I'm more worried about the, the cost of labeling. The labeling was oh, I see. Yes. yes. I'll show you how we get that. Okay, uh, that's a good mess. Yes, because yeah. that's not, not easy, actually. <laughs> Okay, but we, yes, we do have paired instructions and actual generated images that are being generated incrementally. Okay, so like I was saying, in the discriminator, uh, we've done a, a, a few things that are a little bit non-standard in the GAN setup. Uh, the final, the third thing that's a little bit different in our uh, discriminator is we actually add an auxiliary detector, an object detector at the end. Um, that makes the discriminator a little bit uh, more object aware. So uh, it basically just has an extra module that tries to determine whether uh, the expected objects that we have in our data set are present or not. Okay, so that's the, the generator and the discriminator. Uh, there's a few more uh, implementation details which I'll walk through. So first of all, um, the encoding of the previous scene that gets passed through this uh, uh, embedding function, and that gets concatenated to an intermediate layer of the generator. So the generator is being conditioned not only on the noise and the uh, embedding of the instruction, but also it has access to the previously generated scene. Uh, we also have, uh, as I mentioned before, an embedding of the instruction coming in. How it affects the generator, uh, it goes through something called conditioning augmentation. So some of you may have heard of data augmentation before, where you sort of manipulate your uh, input. That can uh, maybe you take images and you sort of shift them, or you rotate them, or you add JPEG, JPEG noise or something like that. We can also uh, do that uh, to the conditioning coming in. Um, and then also, uh, it's a, the not only are we conditioning on it directly in the generator, we also have an effect, the normalization of the layers of the generator into, in something called, that's called conditional batch norm. So the, in, the instruction embedding is actually interacting with the generator in multiple shapes. Uh, I mentioned before that we do fusion of the previous scene and the current scene. We try both uh, concatenation and uh, subtraction. The reason why subtraction is interesting is because it's basically giving an encoding to the discriminator of what has changed in the scene. Uh, we show later on that that's uh, useful to do. Uh, and then we also condition uh, the discriminator on the embedding of the instruction, the context uh, uh, aware embedding as well. And then finally, uh, the generator and the discriminator get updated every time step, where the, whereas the GRUs uh, here, the GRU here, and uh, this uh, EFG, they only get updated every sequence. Okay, yes? Uh, in terms of augmentation, you are only doing that on the context aware uh, condition, not on the free That's correct, we're only doing it on the context aware. And in terms of the subtraction, uh, when the context, when the, uh, when the basically f of g is changing from uh, previous time step to new time step, yep. does 
only new objects get added by your generator, or previous objects locations would also change. Oh, so the, the generator is only getting a condition; it's not being constrained to reproduce the exact same position. In the data sense that we consider, we uh, only are adding new objects. Uh, now, the generator itself can manipulate pixels arbitrarily, so technically it could move things around and subtract them, but we're not, we haven't really explored that angle. That's actually one of our future work, is I would like to sort of do this sort of iterative modification. Some instruction says, well, I want you to change that image some way, but in all the data sets, we're going to show you the data sets we consider, we're only basically considering incremental generation of scenes where things get added. And there's no subtraction goes from? There's no, we're not asking it to subtract anything. Though it technically has the power to subtract things if it wanted to, because it's just manipulating pixels. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that's the architecture. Uh, let me just walk you through the objective, and then we're done with the math, and we can look at uh, some results. So, um, for those of you who've seen seen GANs, uh, they're often uh, trained alternately. You train the generator and the discriminator in alternating stages, and so we'll explore first the the loss of the discriminator. Um, so basically, we've got uh, these different uh, terms. So uh, there's this uh, term D real, which is basically you want the discriminator, from the discriminator's point of view, it wants to call real data real, right? This is data from our, our, our training set. Uh, uh, then we also have a term LD fake, and this is from the discriminator's perspective, it wants to call synthesized data fake. We also, I mentioned before, have these pairs where we've taken mismatched instructions and images. So we have like a ground truth image and a wrong instruction. We want, from the discriminator's perspective, it should be calling those uh, pairs wrong as well. Uh, we have a one half to just basically balance the things that it's calling fake with the things that it's calling real. And then we have this term, which I mentioned before, it's, it's uh, attached to the auxiliary loss function. So we're also getting our discriminator to uh, detect specific objects that are in the scene. And that's been the, basically that has a hyperparameter beta. Okay, so um, this basically shows each of these terms, uh, which is uh, effectively, um, basically here, in, in each of these stages is for the, the, the real loss, we're operating our discriminator on real data uh, and the, the true context. Wrong is being operated on, uh, again, real data, and this is, uh, the hat here is indicating mismatched context. And then on the fake data, we're operating uh, the uh, discriminator on data that's coming from uh, the generator, so it's synthesized data, given noise and uh, its context. Uh, and then also the discriminator is seeing uh, the true context, okay? So this, this is sort of the context that is being built up from uh, what's been generated. Okay, so then we also have this uh, delivery loss, as I said before. Uh, this is just a cross entropy loss uh, based on uh, all of the possible objects in our data set. And you'll see what those are shortly. And, like you saw the sort of little different balls, colored balls, and uh, uh, in synthetic scenes, but maybe there's people and trees and suns and planes and so, so forth. Uh, those are the types of objects that we're trying to detect with the auxiliary loss function. And then finally, we have the loss for the generator. Uh, which is basically the, it, the generator is effectively trying to fool the discriminator. So we basically want the discriminator to take data from the generator uh, and uh, context and call it fake. And also the generator is being trained with the same uh, auxiliary loss function. So that's the objective. Okay, so now for Frank's question. What does the data actually look like? So uh, this is difficult because nobody has actually explored this task before. So there is no existing uh, data set that had basically series of instructions and images being uh, built up incrementally. Uh, but there is this data set called CODRAW, uh, and it comes in the form of sequences of scenes of images of children playing together uh, with 58 different objects. They're playing in a park, there's trees, there's tables, there's animals, and so forth. Uh, and so this is what the data would look like. Um, uh, you basically have a teller and a uh, someone that's basically saying what should be in the scene, and then the drawer responding to them. The drawer responses are not that exciting most of the time, uh, but the teller is basically you know, saying top left corner, big sign, orange part, uh, cut right side, far medium, apple tree, I see four apples. Okay, and that's what should be in the scene there. 
On turn two, the teller is saying left side, girl, big size, running, facing right, head above horizon, and so forth. So we had a question before about the size of the different things. Uh, in this data set, there's actually um, specifying the size of uh, particular objects in the, in the instructions. Um, in this uh, case, uh, the teller is basically describing a boy coming into the scene, giving a soccer ball. Uh, in the next uh, uh, scene, um, they're actually talking about making the tree uh, modify, moving it up, uh, and a bit, boy's hand covered strongly, that, that type of thing. Okay, so the uh, other data set we experienced, as experimented with uh, was based on something called Clever. And this is a popular uh, visual question answering data set um, that's been, I think it came out in 2016, so it's been used quite a bit. Uh, and the interesting thing about this data set is that it's generated entirely programmatically. So um, the code is open source, so we took this data set. Um, we're not trying to do a VQA data set, but because it's generated programmatically, we are able to grab hold of it, fork it, and basically create a new version of it, uh, which we call Iterative Clever. So you're asking before about the grammar. Basically, uh, we have these templates that say, you know, add a certain color of an object. This could be like a cube or a cylinder or something. Uh, and then it will say in front of or behind. Uh, and to the left or to the right of another object. So here's an example from uh, this Iterative Clever that we generated. So add a science cylinder at the center, add a red cube behind it on the left, and note again that we're, when we say behind it, we're refer referring to the object that was uh, added initially. Um, add a purple cylinder in front of it on the right and in front of the science cylinder. Add a purple cube behind it on the right and in front of the red cube on the right. Uh, add a yellow cylinder behind the purple cylinder on the left and behind the red cube on the right. And so each of these, um, each of these sequences are, are five turns in length. Uh, and we've also uh, we've released this data set as well if, if you're interested in, in trying it out. Can you just talk about a little bit about the randomization that goes into this? So, so when it says behind or to the right, like is there how, how much to the right to play? Is that randomized or, or is it is it random, yeah. to the right meaning a fixed number of units or yeah, just it's it's randomized. I, I think it's like uniform from that that object to the side of the screen. I, my oh, student okay. programmed it. I don't know exactly, but okay. like it basically yeah. it is it is random. So when you say to the and this will come up in the evaluation metric as well. Um, we say to the left uh, of this cylinder. So this red cube uh, behind and to the left could basically appear anywhere, uh, sort of up into uh, up and behind it. Oh, okay, so, so, so if you generate another image from your conditional, if you take the same sequence of instructions and, and with different noise, then, then you get a noticeably different image? Right? You would, with the, yes, with the, with the generator. Um, but in terms of the, the data set, it's been seeded and we've created a, like a, a specific training, validation, and test split so that you could do repeatable experiments on the data set. So you'll have access both to sort of, if you want to generate unlimited data, you could, but there's also a fixed split so you could, actually, so you could compare it to the results. Now it's, it's interesting because when we uh, when we consider evaluation, which is what I'm going to talk about next, uh, because there are many different scenes that correspond to this instruction, uh, we have to evaluate the, evaluate the model in a way that is not penalized if it doesn't generate the exact same layout uh, that you see here. Because if it adds a red cube uh, anywhere behind and to the left of the uh, science cylinder, it should be uh, rewarded for doing that. Uh, so, so basically, this is our, our challenge. Um, so typical metrics like inception score and FID that have been used with uh, GANs uh, typically have been uh, measuring visual quality, so the realism of the generated scenes. Um, but we're also interested in measuring consistency here. That's actually the most important thing is consistency with the series of instructions. So what we do uh, to uh, evaluate these models is we run an object detector on both the ground truth image and the generated uh, image from the model. We get out the detection probabilities for each of the objects that, were, that, are, that are found in the scene, uh, and we get their coordinates. And um, then during evaluation, we can compute precision, recall an F1 score that tells us at least whether the right objects were generated by the generator, the objects that were in the scene before. 
Okay, so that tells us if the same objects were generated and detected, but it doesn't tell us uh, if they're in the right relationship with one another. So what we do is using these predicted coordinates, we actually generate a scene graph, and we see um, whether the, the overlapping set of objects that are both in the ground truth and in the generated model, uh, whether they have the same uh, edges in their scene graph. So in other words, are they in the same relationships these, uh, between the ground truth and the generated images? And so that's what you're uh, seeing here. You basically have a series of edges uh, that are in the, the generated scene corresponding to the relationships between the objects, a series of edges in the ground truth, um, and seeing if whether they uh, intersect. Uh, they're divided by the number of edges in the ground truth, and then we multiply that by the recall. Uh, and so we call this the relative similarity score. And so what it's doing is it's capturing both whether the objects are consistent uh, with the instructions and whether they're in the same relative uh, positions. So just to give you some examples of how this uh, would work, uh, take for example this uh, generated image and this ground truth. Okay, so in the generated image, we've got a gray cube, brown cube, gray sphere, blue sphere, yellow cube, yellow sphere, green cylinder. Uh, sorry, in the sorry that these are sphere, sphere blues for the generated image, and so for the ground truth image, we've got um, yellow cube, yellow sphere, green cylinder, brown cylinder, and cyan cylinder. Okay, so basically in this image, there's no overlap in objects between the ground truth and the generated image, so the recall is zero and the relative similarity score is zero. Uh, in this next example, uh, we have a few objects overlapping. So we have cyan and gray cylinders, which were found in both. Um, uh, and uh, those are the only ones that overlap. Uh, they're in the right relative positions. Uh, so we have a, a 0.4 recall score and a 0.25 sim our relative similarity score, because that's being scaled by the recall. Um, and then in this scene, Basically, you have all of the objects matching up between the generated scene and the ground truth, but some of the spatial relationships are incorrect. So that leads to a recall of 1 and a relative similarity of 1.25. And in a final case, you basically have um, a generated scene which looks consistent with uh, the ground truth in terms of the objects that are present and the relative uh, locations. So you have a recall of 1 and a, a relative uh, similarity of 1. And so you notice that the images are sort of pixel by pixel, not identical in this case, uh, but they'll still get a perfect score because the objects are there and they're in the right uh, relative location. Okay, so another thing um, that was challenging is this is a brand new task, so there aren't any uh, baseline models out there uh, to, which to which to compare. Uh, so we've done an ablation study where we look at different modules that are present and test uh, their importance. So effectively, what we're seeing here is um, a, a few differently defined versions of our model, uh, and then these are whether certain properties are present in these models. So for example, uh, the baseline model doesn't have this, uh, the use of incorrect uh, instruction sets and correct images in the loss. Uh, it doesn't have the context-free conditioning, so it doesn't see the previously generated scene. It's basically always starting from scratch, uh, it doesn't have any delivery loss, and it doesn't do any uh, fusion uh, to the discriminator. Uh, we also then have this sort of, uh, what we call the mismatch model, which takes the baseline and adds this, uh, these mismatch pairs. Uh, the G prior model has the same as before, but it introduces the uh, addition of the previous scene to the generator, uh, so it's not always starting from scratch, it has access to the previously generated streak scene. Uh, we have a model that has the auxiliary classifier, and then we have basically the full model with two different uh, types of fusions, concatenation fusion and uh, subtraction fusion. So basically each of these is a different uh, variant of our model, um, and then we evaluate them. Do you have a question? In the first two models, did you compensate uh, the lack of f t minus 1 with basically the previous context? 
They both have access to the contacts. So in, in, in all of the cases, they always have in, uh, access to the instructions. No, but if you remove the FTT minus one, they mm -hmm. have to also provide it in the context of the previous steps. We should. Uh, they have they have access to this previous uh, instructions through that recurrent next. That's creating a basically an embedding of the, the history of instructions. But not the generator is not being handed the previous scene at each. But not directly have access to the previous one, like Exactly. So it basically would have to sort of remember uh, or use or exploit the series of instructions to sort of recreate what's there. And you can imagine that's harder for it to do. So yeah, I forgot just a tiny bit of the architecture. What's that FGT plus one or minus one coming from? What's that generated from? Yeah, so it's coming from uh, an embedding of like this guy up here. So we basically have an okay. embedder that okay. produces like a vector representation of uh, the previous image. Okay, I know there's a lot of there's a lot of moving parts in the architecture. Okay. Um, okay. So this is what we see. Uh, effectively, um, as we add these components in, we see that most of them are uh, making a difference in terms of uh, better performance. So both on the, the code raw data set and I, and I Clever, we do see some subtle changes uh, between the different um, different data sets. So for example, when we add the the G prior um, in iClever, there's quite a large uh, increase on the RSIM score, whereas there's not uh, much of an uh, increase on the, the code draw. And effectively, there's more uh, complex relationships involved in the iClever scene, so ha having access to the previous scene uh, is, is more beneficial. Um, the auxiliary loss model actually has different effects on, on the two data sets as well. So you'll see that um, in code draw, actually adding the auxiliary uh, loss drops precision quite a bit. There's, there's a lot more objects in uh, the code draw data set. And basically, it's getting it to, I think what it's doing is it's getting it to focus on the sort of more uh, prevalent objects. Um, but in the uh, iClever data set, you don't see the same hit uh, to pre pre precision. Uh, and then the other thing that's kind of interesting here is that uh, the, the subtraction fusion, as we hypothesize would work better, actually does end up being the best. So basically giving the model direct access to what's been changed in the scene, uh, that helps the, the discriminator. Okay, so just to show you uh, quickly some qualitative results. Uh, this is how the, the model works. Basically, start with a blank canvas, give it some instructions, bushy tree in the middle, generates a bushy tree, full sun right corner, puts the sun, uh, plain top left corner, uh, boy between sun and soccer ball, hands out facing left, and then you get the boy. So what you see um, is it's very good at generating sort of like the, the, the overall scene, um, course details, but it does have some difficulty in capturing some of the finer details, for example, like the details around the face. The face doesn't do very well with facial expressions. Um, it doesn't really accurately do uh, object poses that well. Uh, and then also on code draw, it struggles when we give it many instructions to add to the scene at once. So it's very good at generating sort of one object at a time, but it struggles with uh, multiple instructions. On iClever, this is just an example of a generation. So add a cosine cube at the center, add a brown sphere on the right of it, add a blue sphere behind it. On the left, you hide the cosine cube on the right. Sorry, add a red sphere in front of the brown sphere on the left and in front of the cosine cube on the right. Add a purple cylinder behind it on the left and in front of the cosine cube on the left. And so it does a, a, a decent job. Um, so it's, again, it's capturing basically spatial relationships, uh, colors very well. Um, in some instances, when the image gets very crowded, it fails to add in the fifth <coughs> object. So that's the one thing it struggles with on the iCover data set. Yes? So what about the safe object? We only do five turns in this, in this data set. So we, we, do, we didn't generate any data that had six objects. But you could do that. I mean, it's, it's programmatic. So. Yeah, so, so I remember one of the issues that people 
people observing clever is that the grammar was limited. And so when they generate data, they exhaustively generate data to the point that you could almost find the answer in the training set, whatever it is that you're querying. So uh, what it essentially means is that the model learns to approximate the existing knowledge, the set that was generated exhaustively like that. Mm -hmm. You can observe the same trend here. Um, I mean, we, we haven't, to the best of my knowledge, we haven't done any tests with uh, continuing to get it to add objects after the fifth object. Again, it's like we've seen cases when it breaks down the fifth object because the scene is already pretty crowded. So I imagine it wouldn't do so well for sixth and seventh and eighth and so forth object. Um, one thing that we did find that was interesting, I'll just try to pull it up. Um, is uh, it does it is able to start from a non-empty canvas, which is interesting because in, in all cases we started it with a, a blank canvas. But if you give it an, an existing canvas and you ask it to add objects to it, it can it can handle that and go onwards. Um, but yeah, I mean we haven't tested it with a lot more uh, objects. And is it sensitive to the canvas? If you change the background? Would it ruin everything? It shouldn't, though. Like, if it's learning the task, it shouldn't depend on what actually is in the background, right? Other than recognizing the shapes that it's supposed to recognize, which are just the same. So I, I it should be very know, to yeah. the background. Um, I don't know how it would do with a different canvas. Um, it may be brittle to that as well. But we have to see. I, yeah, I haven't tested. Yes. So when you tested with the non-blank canvas, did you create a, a word embedding, embedding for that as well, or were you just starting it from scratch? Like, did you tell it, oh, add a red sphere was was hap like happened before? Like, did uh, H T minus one exist before? Like, oh when you're adding it? no, I'm pretty sure that's what it was generalizing. So basically, we, we were just using the same uh, initialized H zero. Okay. Uh, so it, and it was generalizing it was, beyond that. So did you yeah. then test as well for just not using each, like the prior edge at all? Because if it, if it can do this uh, based off of just the image context, how, how much is it leaning oh. on the prior uh, like uh, instruction context in a sense? Right. Um, yeah, I don't have that the ablation study, but uh -huh. to the best of my knowledge, it, it, does, it will break down if it doesn't have access to the past series of instructions. Like, it, it, it does actually help the model to have that recurrence and, and basically allow it to look back in time. It's just interesting to see that in this sense, it's not like it's still. Yeah. yeah. Again, the scene's not super crowded at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's a good it's a good question. Okay. So we have roughly 15 minutes to go. Uh, that's basically what I wanted to say about uh, this model, the Geneva GAN setup. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about is basically a little bit more about evaluating uh, conditional image generation. So I talked about sort of the, the focus of existing metrics on visual quality, so realism. Do your generated images look like real, like real training data? But there's a couple other things that we care about in conditional image generation that we don't care about in uh, unconditional generation. So we talked about image quality, but this idea of conditional consistency. So this is what we explored in the previous examples. We had instructions, we want to remain consistent with instructions. But we also want to have a notion of uh, interconditioning variability. So if I condition on, say, a caption, um, there are infinite images that could are, that are, that are valid and, and correspond to that caption. So can we uh, basically uh, come up with a metric that could capture all three of these important properties, quality, consistency, and diversity. So the popular metrics, namely uh, Inception Score and FID, as I mentioned, they both uh, capture visual quality. Uh, they don't capture conditional consistency, again, because they were developed in the context of uh, unconditional image generation. Uh, and then in terms of interconditioning diversity, Inception score doesn't capture it at all, uh, and FID captures it somewhat indirectly. So what I mean by uh, somewhat indirectly, basically FID can't capture interconditioning uh, diversity when the joint distribution of the two variables changes, 
but the marginal distribution uh, is unaltered. So here's a specific example of that. Uh, we have two variables, uh, x and y, and these are their joint distributions. So mar if we marginalize out x and we're left with a distribution over y, the distributions are the same. Uh, but the joints are different. And so if we condition on x, so take a, basically a setting of x, and look at the conditional distribution of uh, y. So this would be basically the setting where we were fixing, uh, say, an instruction or a caption, and pretend that y is the image being generated. The distributions are quite different. So one is more diverse than the other. So if we evaluate FID on uh, these distributions, the FID score will be zero. They'll be identical because the, uh, the marginals are the same. Uh, but a metric that actually uh, considers the, uh, both variables, x and y, would have uh, a, a, a non-zero uh, metric for a situation where the, there was a, a difference in diversity between the conditional distributions. So um, what people write, do right now uh, to measure things like conditional consistency and interconditional diversity is they use multiple metrics. So you'll find tables, here's some, I think this is a UBC thing, right? I don't know if the authors are here, but you'll find tables like this where you're doing model selection, uh, and you'll have, say, an FID capture of visual quality, and these are a number of different metrics. Uh, the more popular one for diversity is L, called something called LPIBS. Uh, and you'll see that different models are performing uh, <coughs> differently in along these different metrics. So one is sort of best in FID, one is best on NDB, one is best on JSD, and one is best on LPIBS, and so forth. So it makes uh, it somewhat ambiguous to do model selection to pick the best model. Because one is better for diversity, one's better for consistency, one's better for visual quality. Uh, also when you're doing ablation studies like the one we did, uh, you're looking at variance of your model, and in this case, taken from another paper, uh, you have a situation where uh, you're using inception score, the full model is based on inception score, but uh, one of the uh, ablated models is doing better on conditional consistency, and the other one is doing better on uh, diversity for example. So it's, it's hard to choose the best model. Um, so let me quickly uh, do a review of uh, freshly inception distance because this is what we base our evaluation metric on. Uh, so it was proposed a few years ago and the idea is to take a reference distribution, so say a, a test set uh, and your generated images and uh, compute uh, a Gaussian on those two distributions. So you have a mu coming from your reference, uh, mu hat coming from your uh, generated uh, images, and then you've got a, uh, a sigma, uh, which is your sample covariance coming from your uh, reference distribution, a sample covariance coming from your generated images, uh, and you basically compute this Wasserstein also, uh, two, also known as a, a fresh distance uh, between these two distances. And so when you, what, what you're using to compute these mu's is actually an embedding from an Inception V3 model. That's why um, they, they, these, these models are very, very this, this particular architecture is quite uh, popular. It's used for the Inception score. It's also used for FID. Uh, basic, but basically, for your mu, you basically push uh, your images through this uh, Inception module, uh, cut it off near the top, take those vectors, and compute the mean, and then do the same thing to compute the covariance. So what we propose to do instead is when we're conditioning models, we're going to compute a joint distribution. So basically we're going to embed our images through F, so just like we did with the inception uh, before, but we're also going to embed our conditioning. So whether we're conditioning on text, or we're conditioning on bounding boxes, or we're conditioning on class labels, we would embed that somehow. Uh, we have a scaling factor such that one of these uh, doesn't dominate the other because there might be differences, say, in dimensionality. Uh, and then we also have a merging function that takes these two uh, different embeddings uh, and, 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 and merges them. Uh, and then we just apply uh, FID. So we basically get this for the reference distribution, the, this for the images that are being generated, and then we get a, a distance. So there's three things to choose. Uh, one is the embedding that we use for the conditioning information, one is the scaling factor, and one is the merging function. So in terms of selecting uh, the embedding function, uh, 
basically the idea is you're going to, just like you do for the images, you reduce the uh, dimensionality and you extract some useful information. Uh, we want to do this for the conditioning as well. So because we have different conditioning modalities, uh, we may have different off-the-shelf embeddings for them. So the ones that we've used in this work, uh, for example, for class and attribute labels, we can just use one hobby encodings. For bounding boxes, we use auto encoders. And for anything else that basically doesn't have a standard off-the-shelf embedding, you can basically use something generic like an auto encoder. For images, we can use Inception D3. And for captions, you can use, we've used sentence first, but you can basically use a standard uh, text or sentence embedding. Uh, there's, as I mentioned before, the scaling factor that basically trains off between uh, the, the conditioning embedding and the image embedding. Um, we recommend uh, basically setting alpha to the ratio of the L2 norm of the image embedding and the conditioning embedding calculated on the, on the training set. And uh, what we see uh, here is if we do basically a sweep of different values of alpha, this is basically our recommended setting, which is this uh, ratio. Uh, at alpha equals zero, this corresponds to FID, because the embedding basically doesn't uh, consider the conditional part of the embedding, it only considers the image embedding, so that would be FID over here. And then over going this way would just be different, uh, different variants of FJD, the Frechet joint instance, using a different setting of alpha. And so what we've done here is we've compared um, different settings of this big GAN model, which has this parameter uh, sigma, and sigma basically trades off diversity and image quality. And so you can see here over on the left that there's a certain ordering of these different models, the so different models with the different colors plots. So there's a certain ranking of them for FID. Uh, but as we move over uh, with uh, non-zero alpha, we eventually get a different ranking. Okay, so you can see that FJB starts to consider uh, diversity and doesn't necessarily, uh, basically these two models here, which have extreme um, values of uh, sigma, get re-ranked eventually when you uh, consider it around zero alpha. But the other thing I can show here is basically, um, once you get past a certain point, uh, the model isn't extremely sensitive to uh, the ranking state system. Okay, the last choice you need to make is this merging function. So uh, the ones that we've evaluated are concatenation, element-wise sum, element-wise multiplication, and then doing a linear projection, projection followed by concatenation. Um, in every case, there's a strong negative correlation uh, between the F FJD and the conditional consistency. Um, for all of the uh, merging functions across data sets we, we tested. So we don't really see a, a, a a clear reason to use any of these other than you know, concatenation is the simplest, it doesn't change the dimensionality, it doesn't int introduce any additional parameters, so we recommend just doing concatenation and we use it in our experiments. So basically, um, we considered this data set called DSprite Textures, uh, which has um, these basically simple objects uh, in different colors on a, on a black background. We've introduced multiple textures for these objects, uh, and we can very finely control these objects' position, their shape, their scale, their rotation. Um, and so this allows us to play precisely with the things that we're interested in. We can play with the conditioning, uh, check if it's consistent. We can play with the diversity by swapping the textures. Um, and we can also do things like introduce noise, which, which plays around with the image quality. So, um, for example, in the image quality experiments, what we've done is we've taken 10,000 10, of these uh, synthetic images as a reference data set, and then we take another 10,000, and we introduce varying levels of noise. And so we see for both the FID, which is a standard metric of visual quality, that's in blue, and different variants of FJD where we consider conditioning on class, or bounding box, or image masks, uh, they track each other pretty well. Okay, so both FID and these variants of FJD care about uh, visual quality. That's not surprising. But when we go to conditional consistency, so this is where we take a 10K reference data set, and then we have a 10K set of images in which we do basically a swap 
where uh, we exchange the attributes um, for, uh, as, for basically, uh, we, we, we exchange conditionings on images that are identical except for one particular attribute. So one attribute changes such that this conditioning is no longer consistent, but all the other attributes remain the same. Uh, and this allows us to control for this conditional consistency, but we keep the marginal distributions unchanged because we're just swapping uh, pairs of uh, images in the data set. And so what we see here is that when we swap for, this is making the scale inconsistent between the generated image and the thing that we're conditioning on, as we increase the offset, we, we notice that both FID and class conditioning FJD don't change. So the class conditioning basically has no information about scale at all, so that's expected. FID again only cares about visual quality, but we see that the FJD is sensitive when the, uh, there's inconsistency in the conditioning. Orientation, we see a similar thing, but what's happening around uh, 90 and 180 is that the, uh, in the case of uh, bounding boxes and masks, they're actually lining up to sort of approximately uh, overlap with each other at 90 degrees and 180 degrees. So you actually see the, the distance go down at those points. Um, and then as we manipulate the X position and the Y position, we also see that FJD is sensitive. So when we have uh, conditional inconsistencies, we see FJD going up, whereas FID doesn't go up. And then finally, the other thing that we investigate is interconditioning <coughs> diversity. So what we do in this case is we stratify the attributes. So for example, we would take, um, say, squares, ellipses, and hearts. We took the shape attribute. And we would assign textures specifically to that stratification. So a diversity score of 1 means that we would have a uniform distribution of textures over that stratification. So so squares, ellipses, and hearts would roughly get the same textures, all of them. Um, the diversity score of zero means that each of those strata has only a single texture assigned to it. Um, and then anything that was sort of a middling score of diversity means that the uh, particular uh, texture would be peaked over a particular attribute. And so we can basically adjust the, tech, the, the diversity in each of these uh, conditionings, whether it be shape, scale, orientation, and exposition. Uh, and again, we see that uh, FJD is sensitive uh, to the uh, change in diversity. Now, one thing that I'll point out uh, is that FID is also sensitive to diversity because changing this uh, Changing the distribution between attributes and uh, textures also affects the marginal distribution over the images. Again, as I showed before, um, the FID does, does capture that. However, uh, if the image marginal distribution were to stay consistent, then uh, FID would be uh, sensitive to it. Okay, so. Um, we do evaluation not just on the synthetic data sets, but on a number of uh, real data sets like ImageNet. So we do class condition models, free state of the art architectures. Uh, we evaluate them according to FJD, FID, uh, class conditional uh, metric, and uh, diversity score. We also do text condition models uh, where we use an RNN type embedding for a text. Uh, we again compare several uh, state of the art uh, text conditioning models. Uh, and then we also do pixel-to-pixel uh, -pixel models. So this is where you condition on an image and you uh, generate another image. Uh, in each of these cases, uh, we have situations where uh, FJD and FID both recommend uh, the same model. Um, but in another case where we've used FJD for metaparameter tuning, um, we see situations where FID and FJD recommend different models. So this is a case where we're looking at for an uh, auxiliary classifier GAN. This basically has a parameter that trades off the strength of using this auxiliary classifier. Um, and you can basically have a trade-off between visual quality and conditioning consistency. So for a low value, you'll see high um, quality, uh, but not good conditional consistency. Whereas if you have high value of uh, lambda, you get very good conditional consistency, but quality tends to drop. FJD finds sort of the sweet spot where you have sort of a good mixture of visual quality and functional consistency. So
So, uh, in summary, I've talked about two different uh, setups. One is this Geneva model uh, for generating um, iteratively uh, synthesized images. Uh, we've also introduced this relational similarity metric. Uh, and in future work, we've only done synthetic data sets, so we'd like to scale up to more realistic images. Uh, we'd like to have not just an iterative, but an interactive setup where we can have the, the drawer ask questions, perhaps do disambiguation questions to the teller, and also having a model that can recover from its mistakes. On the FJD side, uh, we propose this new metric uh, for conditional GANs that simultaneously captures visual quality, conditional consistency, and interconditional diversity. Uh, and we've shown how this model can address some potentially ambiguous trade-offs when doing model selection and hyperparameter tuning. So I want to acknowledge the, the first authors of both of these uh, papers. Ala uh, has just graduated. Uh, he's starting a PhD in Paris uh, next month. Uh, and, and Terence uh, is a PhD student in my lab. And uh, both, of, both of these were collaborations with um, uh, different industry partners, one uh, MSR Montreal and the other one with uh, FAIR Montreal. So we had a number of collaborators, uh, particularly Shikhar and, and Mikhail uh, at MSR and FAIR respectively who were very uh, engaged with the project. And there are the references if you're interested in following up. Uh, both of these uh, papers release data sets and they have code that replicate all the experiments if you're interested in trying it yourself. Thank you. So, um, or, or just just the size of the data sets to start, like get yeah, start. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, it, I guess it, it depends on. We have several data sets here. So, uh, let's talk about the the first in the Geneva. So, yeah. there's CoDraw. Um, in that case, there were these are both synthetic data sets. So, we have on, on the order of millions of examples okay. that we produced. Same with the uh, D-sprite textures. So, it's something like two million. Okay. Examples. So, 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 it, and so the code draw, it, 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 it has like a tree sprite that it puts in a certain spot, or and that tree yeah. sprite is, is is like one of five tree sprites, or or like uh, I think how much variety does it have, right? Like so, because when I first saw it, I thought, wow, okay, so, you know, you can't take you know hand drawn things, but but then there's a, there's a there's a bit, yeah there's a hand drawn things I would imagine have much more variation than that procedure generated. Yeah, yeah, so it's recently yeah. one sprite that can get scaled okay. and move okay. around okay. Okay. Um, okay. for the code draw. For uh, D-Sprite, similar, right? Like there's just a certain number of shapes, different colors, different textures, they can get rotated, scaled, moved around. Um, clever. So it's a sprite-based model. They're all sprite, yeah, okay. they're all sprite-based models. Yeah. Like we're not at the point where we can do this on real images. And that's where we hope we can we can go. But yeah, again, sure. collecting that data is, is hard. So I think it's sure. probably gonna be some uh, some sort of ingenuity involved in how to get that data. Because I don't think you can just sort of have make a bunch of artists sit down and like sort of sketch things. Well, I I see a procedurally uh, script scenes and ray tracer or whatever, right? But, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess it would still be synthetic, but sure, yeah, more yeah. photorealistic, right, perhaps. Right, yeah. So but maybe that's right, the, in terms of the hand-drawn ones, yeah. That's, that's, uh, yeah. Yeah, hand-drawn would be difficult, but I, yeah, I think you're right. Like, maybe there's an intermediate state before we go into like yeah. just hand-drawn stuff. Right. Um, maybe there's something intermediate okay. that could be yeah. procedurally generated. But yeah, but but you're in the millions of images. Basically. We're in the right. millions of images. Right. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Mark. Wouldn't an intermediate be like predicting how the image is going to change based on video game input? Oh, that's an interesting. You have the controller, you condition on what the controller does, and then you predict what the next few frames are going to be. 
it seems like an interlink yeah. between like the real world and what you're doing now. So Hong Black Lee has worked on that a bit, I think, like predicting video game outcomes. And I guess some people in you know that are doing RL experiments and using like model-based RL trained world models also do sort of like future frame prediction for their models. Um, the thing is, you don't have text, you don't have instructions, but you're saying you replace your textual instructions, you're saying with the controller input? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. I guess you no longer have this sort of interaction between language. I mean, where, where I hope we would go is sort of this, like the motivation for this type of stuff would be to uh, interactive, like uh, design software, CAD software, or you know, think for graphic design, creative professionals, where they would be interacting with, with language and sort of iteratively uh, producing a design, whether it's architectural or interior design or graphic design or um, photo editing, all these sorts of applications. That's sort of where we'd like to get to. Um, and the video game stuff takes us a little bit away from that, but it might be fine. Any other questions? Yes? Quick go back to the slide where you were showing the, uh, the results on uh, current scans, like kind of piece of these things. Sure. So, uh, in the diversity criteria, uh, each of these seems to be doing really poorly because, uh, as the PhD paper also indicates, uh, the data set they have is like there's a one to one matching between their sketches and the images. Mm -hmm. And as a result, uh, they point out that the network tends to ignore the random Z space. And consider it as noise because the mapping is unique, so it ends up being a deterministic mapping and not a like probably again. Uh, the diversity side that also indicates that it's close to zero. Oh, on mixed specs over here. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So your F FJD kind of takes into account all these components, yes. including intra conditioning diversity, but we call that I don't know that over here. Uh, so. How, how much did, did that reduce your FJD? Uh, because I'm still saying that, seeing that although the diversity was close to zero, your FJD value is quite high. It goes, yeah, it goes higher, which would conceivably reflect worse diversity, but we don't have a way of sort of decoupling. I mean, we, through the synthetic experiments, we can show that it goes up when, when diversity gets worse. Um, and it goes up when sort of there's conditional inconsistency, but we can't, unfortunately, we can't take an FJD score and separate out these, these effects. So, I, I, I yeah, can, of course I can't answer that question. Any other questions? Yeah, just, yeah. just in terms of feature embeddings for, for images you said you used inception and you said you used word sentence for, for the text ones, did you try any other ones or just those two? Um, we had, yeah, we tried different embeddings, and like, at, at some point we were also thinking uh, it would be nice to use the same embedding for everything, so we've, we've tried autoencoders as well for other different modalities. Um, to be honest, we didn't see a whole lot of difference in terms of rankings when we use different embeddings, but at the end of the day, we, like any metric, you kind of you want to give people a recipe because you want people to use the metric and sort of be able to evaluate consistently across different models. So we thought at the end of the day, the best thing to do would be make some recommendations for particular models if they could be compared to ours. Um, but I don't think it's really that important what embedding you can use, at least from what we saw in our experience. Yeah, I just kind of wonder, because my gut feeling is that the quality of those embeddings, at least up to some level, should have an effect on everything else. It's kind of be like a bottleneck. So like, if they're kind of expressed enough, it wouldn't really matter. That's right. If you're it's expressing it, it should, yes. Yeah. But if you had a terrible embedding that wasn't really capturing uh, any of the signal, then, yeah. but, but in your experience, it, it's kind of expressive enough that it should be fine. That's kind of what you, you found. That's what we found. Okay. Just a, a kind of curiosity question. Like, if you gave it, like, if if, some, if, uh, if you gave it access to, to the media to the sprite basis, sprite. Type uh, position, etc. Then, then how do you think it would fare on on the same model? So, if you just gave it direct access to to, to the underlying feature space that, that's being used to generate the images, it, it, does that? Well, we do give that that we condition. Or? We do condition the model when it generates an image, yeah. like in this in uh, in these guys. Oh yeah, for those guys, you do. Guys. We yeah, do yeah, tell yeah. it, right? Okay. No, yeah, I, I was thinking about that. 
But we condition on different things. Like in some cases, yeah. we'll condition on the, the class. Like that would be maybe that it's a, it's a uh, cylinder or it's a right. square right. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, sure. um, in some cases, we condition on the mask. In yeah, some yeah, cases, yeah. we condition on the yeah, gotcha, gotcha. founding yeah. blocks. No, I, I was thinking about oh, the, other, the other previous examples. Um, right, and the, the other examples, we were only conditioning on the instructions, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. But like, if, if on the image side, you, you just, uh, yeah, okay. okay. If we gave it a more direct encoding and not yeah, the yeah, language, yeah, yeah, yeah. certainly we're going to have more encoding matter or not. Uh, well, yeah. we would expect it to do much better if it had direct access to okay. where things should be in the scene, because the challenge is actually extracting that information from the language. Right, right, right. Okay, gotcha. gotcha. Okay. There's one thing. Yeah. So I've seen some uh, work where uh, modifications to the image were made based on some low quality sketches made by the user. But could you comment on the relative difficulty of training models where the command is provided either by a sketch or by text? Oh, okay. So I think you're asking like, you know, one, one way of doing modification is via text, natural language, and one is to take the image and, and maybe um, have some interface to like mark it up, right? Like change. Like if I want to put a heart on some face, I can just draw a little heart like in Microsoft Paint. Right, and then it replaces that with a realistic hack. Exactly. Uh, I think it's similar to the previous question, because I think when you're interacting directly with the image, you're giving it pretty precise location of where you want that hat to be and some information about the shape and the scale of that hat, which is a lot more direct than trying to infer that from language, right? Like, place a hat on a man's head and make it not so big, or uh, color that hat red. I mean, I, I, I think it's more difficult to do through, through language than it is by direct interaction. Okay. Oh, my. <laughs> what are your thoughts on like training like on a Bob Ross video? You just watch the artist paint and describe what they're doing. Bob Ross, yeah. So I actually have my wife, wife had done some Bob Ross uh, painting like along with it and gave me some ad in the office right now. Um, what, what style is it painted? Like, I don't know Bob Ross. It's watercolor. So, I, 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 yeah, sorry, yeah. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have offended Frank apparently. Yeah. 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 Okay, so I don't Bob Ross. The, 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 the style is not important, but, but the, the salient part is he's saying out loud what he's doing at each step. So he's saying, now I'm going to paint some bushes, now I'm going right. to paint the sun, right. things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, and yeah, sometimes cool. he's giving you text in like speech, yeah. and then he's also yeah, describing yeah. what he's doing. So you have the different steps, you have the text, but it's a bit more challenging and it's more describing towards what you were wanting to move towards. It's, it's the closest <coughs> of what we want to get to anything I've heard so far. And it's also got a certain kitsch that would make it fun to do it. You know, talk. <laughs> <laughs> right. awesome. We don't have enough episodes. Oh, he's he's, he's there. There's, there's a lot of episodes. Hundreds and hundreds. He'll be there for many years. <laughs> no, I know he did it for many years, but this season is like 11 or 12 paintings. Uh, I think it's more than that, isn't it? I know, I remember I was looking at it. He says that he does everything over one day and then read it, like, goes through every painting for each episode and like how frustrating he was to produce so many episodes. But I don't think it's enough for a training. But it's 403. 403. 403. 403 episodes. Yeah, 30 seasons. Yeah, so that, like it's, it's definitely several orders of magnitude different than the, like if we take the full scenes. Um, the, only, the other thing I can think of is if you're going from like police yeah. engines, like there's a lot of those now, but I don't see how you ever get access to like the full set of data. Yeah, that's also interesting. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs>